Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about amiodarone or cardarone. This is a commonly prescribed and highly effective antiarrhythmic drug. Basically, it works against the entire spectrum of cardiac arrhythmias where the heart beats too fast. It's effective in the atria, it's effective in the ventricles, it's effective for sustained tachyarrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation. Problem with the drug is it has a lot of side effects, so that might limit its long-term use. It should only be used when people have potentially life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias or in people who have atrial fibrillation to keep them in normal sinus rhythm or at some times to convert from atrial fibrillation back to normal rhythm. It also can be used to decrease the shocks in people who have implantable cardiac defibrillators. It seems to be superior to other treatments for that purpose. As an example, if a person has atrial fibrillation and has been converted back to normal sinus rhythm, it seems that amiodarone is going to keep them that way in about 65% of the time versus only about 37% of the time with sodalol. However, because of the side effect profile, if you're well controlled with an anticoagulant and a rate control medicine, stay that way. It also can be used as prophylaxis against sudden cardiac death in people with ventricular tachyarrhythmias or even ventricular fibrillation oftentimes used in association with an implantable cardiac defibrillator. The drug itself is considered a class 3 antiarrhythmic. It slows the heart rate down. It also works as a beta blocker, a calcium blocker, and it works on the sodium channels, but its use should be limited to doctors who are very familiar with its use and have uh, all of the modalities to treat people who have life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. The effect is shortly after intravenous therapy, takes minutes to hours to be effective. It takes longer if you take it by mouth, takes two to three days to start being effective, but to be fully effective is going to take somewhere between one and three weeks, and that's even with a loading dose. The correlation between the amount that's in the plasma and the cardiovascular effects, unfortunately, it's not a direct one. But if you do take the drug, you need to have regular adherence to seeing the doctor. You have to see the doctor every six months, at least. You need a history and physical and cardiovascular monitoring, Halder monitoring, maybe even electrical stimulation of the heart, depending on the underlying condition. You have to have blood tests to check your liver, check your thyroid. You have to have a chest x-ray and pulmonary function tests to check your lungs. And you need to have an eye examination by an ophthalmologist because of the side effects that the drug may result in. Now, it's not for people who have cardiogenic shock and not for people who have abnormally slow rhythm, sick sinus syndrome. Unfortunately, those people are excluded. And if you have a sensitivity to either the drug or to iodine, you shouldn't take the drug. The drug may cause potentially life-threatening arrhythmias by itself. So even though you're using it to treat arrhythmias, it can cause arrhythmias. So we have a delicate balance here. And we have the potential for fatal toxicity with the medicine, maybe pulmonary toxicity. Two to seven percent of the people who take a dose at 400 milligrams a day are going to have some significant lung side effects. Some studies would suggest it's even as high as 10 to 17 percent, and there's going to be some liver injury if you take the drug. It's very common. There's a black box warning. The black box warning says if you take the drug, it might slow your heart rate too much in 2 to 5 percent of the people, and it might make the arrhythmias difficult to control. And again, 2 to 5 percent of the people. When you get a loading dose, especially intravenously, obviously has to be done in the hospital. And interestingly, about 50 percent of the people who get the loading dose already are going to have to have the dose reduced. And somewhere between 15 and 20 percent are going to discontinue the medicine because of side effects. If you take the drug, 75 percent of the people are going to have side effects especially if you take more than 400 milligrams a day, and about 15 to 20 percent of the people are going to discontinue the drug because of side effects. And if you take the drug intravenously, chances are about 10 to 15 percent that you're going to have some phlebitis. The short-term side effects are related to the beta blocker and the calcium antagonistic effects with low blood pressure and very slow heart rate. But pulmonary toxicity is a significant issue can come on acutely or be delayed for days or weeks. 
can develop pulmonary masses, pulmonary infiltrate, bleeding into the lungs, coughing up blood, pleural effusions, fluid in the lungs, bronchospasm and wheezing, shortness of breath. Some people develop cough and fever and low oxygen levels. Can progress to respiratory failure. The pulmonary toxicity seems to be linked to the total dose of the medicine, but even at the dose of 200 milligrams a day for two years or more, up to 15% of the people may develop some pulmonary toxicity. The pulmonary toxicity can develop with any dose at any time, and it's worse if you've had pre-existing lung disease. Now, you don't want to discontinue it just because you have a cough because the cough might be due to congestive heart failure, pulmonary embolism, or maybe it's an infection, or maybe you have a malignancy. And remember, the drug is being used for potentially life-threatening arrhythmias. So if you stop the drug, you might have a life-threatening arrhythmia. So you want to make sure that there's reason to discontinue the drug. Well, because of the lung problems, that's why you need to go and see the doctor at least every six months, have some pulmonary function tests, have a chest x-ray, and it can cause arrhythmias. Arrhythmias if you happen to have abnormal electrolytes, if you have low levels of sodium, potassium rather, magnesium or calcium, if you develop diarrhea, take a diuretic, take a laxative, take some steroids, they can all alter your electrolytes. And you have to be very careful if you're taking a hepatitis C medicine like Carvoni or Sivaldi. And it might cause arrhythmias with an extraordinarily slow heart rate. So it's not used for people who have digitalis toxicity. And the drug is very toxic to the thyroid. Remember, the drug is 37% by weight iodine, 75 milligrams in a 200 milligram tablet. And that's going to prevent the conversion of T4 to the active thyroid hormone T3. And it might have some direct toxic effect on the thyroid. So it could cause either hyper or hypothyroidism. The worst is the hyperthyroidism, the thyrotoxicosis. That can lead to arrhythmias. Well, the thyroid condition generally occurs in people who have toxic nodular goiter or people who have Graves' disease. Hyperthyroidism occurs in about 2% of the people who take the drug, especially if you happen to come from areas of the world where there isn't enough iodine intake it seems that the hyperthyroidism is more toxic than the hypothyroidism. Signs of the thyrotoxicosis, overactive thyroid, could be arrhythmias or unexpected weight loss or fatigue or tremor or muscle weakness or even, unfortunately, possibly death. But more commonly is hypothyroidism. It can come on either as a primary problem or it can come on in the aftermath of amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism her thyroidism. Treatment might be just reduce the dose or discontinue the dose, but the hypothyroidism can still persist for several months after you stop the drug. And it may cause inflammation of the thyroid, inflammation of the thyroid, where short term it causes uh, an increased level of thyroid hormone for weeks or months, and then after a while it causes a decrease causes hypothyroidism. So you have to be careful. Another reason why you need routine screening every couple, six months. And then the drug, at least in the animals and rat studies, may cause follicular adenomas and thyroid carcinomas. And if you take the drug, well, there's about a 50% chance that you're going to have abnormal liver function tests, promptly reversible when you discontinue the dose or lower the dose. If we were to do a biopsy of the liver, it looks like you were drinking too much. You have an alcoholic hepatitis type pattern. And it doesn't spare the gastrointestinal system either. So people who take the drug, up to 30% of them, are going to suffer from nausea or vomiting or constipation, lack of appetite, anorexia. And the drug can affect the eye. All ocular tissues can be affected, although most of them are not clinically apparent. It causes microdeposits in the cornea in more than 90% of the people only find it with a slit lamp. But about 10% of the people are going to complain of visual halos or blurred vision, maybe dry eyes or photophobia. We're going to have clinically apparent optic neuritis or non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, a condition you first heard of in the story about Viagra many years ago. These problems occur in up to 10% of the people may cause some diminished vision or with the latter condition I mentioned, may cause sudden blindness. 
That's why you need to go see the eye doctor. You need to go see the eye doctor every six months, have a fundoscopy, have them look in your eye, have a slit lamp examination, and it can affect the nervous system, 20 to 40 percent. So it can cause some malaise and fatigue and tremor and involuntary movements and poor coordination might cause abnormal gait or peripheral neuropathy that only slowly and maybe even incompletely disappears after you lower the dose or discontinue the medicine. Affects the skin, 15% of the people. About 10% are going to be photosensitive. There's a peculiar blue-gray discoloration of the skin that comes on after about 18 months of use of the medicine, especially with sun exposure in fairly complected individuals and might be associated with loss of the eyelashes. And if you have surgery, it can cause increased sensitivity to the depressant action of the inhalation anesthesia that's used and lead to post-operative acute respiratory distress syndrome. Not for people who are pregnant, 10 to 50 percent of the medicine is going to cross the placenta, lead to fetal harm, fetal thyroid damage or neurodevelopmental damage as negative growth effects, may lead to premature birth and cause cardiac rhythm disturbances in the newborn. So certainly it's not for women who are breastfeeding. Medicine soluble in fat, soluble in water, it's slowly absorbed, bioavailability is about 50%. Bound to the plasma protein is about 95%. The maximum concentration is about three to seven hours after you take it. There's enhanced absorption if you take it with food if you don't take a loading dose of the medicine, it's probably going to take about nine months to build up to sufficient levels in the system. Seems to be extensive accumulation in various tissues, especially the adipose tissue, highly perfused organs as well, in the liver, in the lung, in the spleen, in the skin, in the muscle. And it seems that the antiarrhythmic effect has something to do with the storage of the medicine, especially in the peripheral component, in the organs themselves. It takes about five to seven days to reach the peak concentration. That's where the antiarrhythmic effect is come, it comes from. And it also accumulates in the deep compartment in the fat. It takes weeks to months to saturate the fat. There's a metabolite of the drug that's also active. Actually, it might be more active than the amiodarone itself. The metabolite is called desethylamiodarone. Medicines eliminated from the body through the biliary tract and the liver. Negligible amount goes out in the urine. No significant alteration necessary if you have impairment, mild impairment of the liver or the kidney. But if you're elderly, probably a reduced dose. Now, it has a complex story with how it's metabolized and its effect on how other drugs are metabolized. But we do know that the half-life of the drug is about 58 days, ranges anywhere between as low as 15 days to a high of about 140 days. Same with the metabolite, the desethylamiodarone. There's a biphasic elimination. The initial half goes out in somewhere between two and a half and 10 days. Then we have a slower terminal elimination that takes about 53 days, because remember, it's in the poorly perfused tissue, in the fat. So it has to get out of the tissue, it has to get out of the fat. Well, because of the slow elimination of the drug, it's going to stick around for a while. So if you stop taking the drug, then that doesn't mean that your arrhythmia is going to come back right away. It might take a period of time. The period of time is unpredictable. It's variable. But we do know if you discontinue the drug and you develop recurrent arrhythmias, if you start taking the drug again, you already have a significant amount in your system. So it takes much less time to become effective. Well, the way the drug works is it slows the automaticity of all of the cardiac tissues. That's the important way it works. And it's also a non-competitive antagonist of the alpha and the beta receptors. So we know a significant amount is going to stay in the tissue for months after you discontinue the drug. Now, let's say you stop the drug and you go see the doctor for some other kind of a problem. And the doctor says, well, I'm going to give you a prescription. You should say right away, hey, I still got some amiodarone in the system, which means that other antiarrhythmics are going to be more toxic. Lithium and tricyclic antidepressants and antipsychotics are going to potentially be more toxic. Abilify and Zyprexa and Respidol and antibiotics like Cipro and Levaquin and Erythromycin and Clarithromycin, Azithromycin, and even the azoles for fungus like Diflucan. 
and it can decrease the heart rate if you happen to combine it with digitalis or a beta blocker or a calcium blocker like verapamil or diltiazem. And you have to be careful if you're taking other drugs that might increase the concentration of amiodarone in the system like the HIV drugs, certain HIV drugs, or claritin or cimetidine or trazodone or even grapefruit juice. And if you happen to have high cholesterol and you're taking Zocor, simvastatin, shouldn't take more than 20 milligrams. The FDA said, hey, if you take more than 20 milligrams of the drug, it might cause accelerated muscle breakdown. That could lead to kidney failure and death. And if you're taking warfarin, you're probably going to have to reduce the dose of warfarin by around 30 to 40 percent. And there's also a problem if you take digitalis or fentanyl or dextromethorphan. Now the dose tends to be a loading dose, 800 to 1600 milligrams a day for several weeks. And then over a period of time, we decrease the medicine, decrease it to 600 to 800 milligrams, and then finally to 200 to 400 milligrams. If you take more than 1,000 milligrams a day, you take it in divided doses. Well, it's got an interesting history. In 1946, a Russian physiologist working in Cairo with a plant extract from Amnivisagnia, that's from the carrot family, the doctor found that well, one of the technicians in his laboratory cured his angina when he took the kelin, which is the ingredient that is used in traditional medicine. When he took the kelin, the angina went away. He was taking it for non-cardiac reasons. So that led an Indian doctor who was a doctoral candidate at Oxford University in England to further research it. And then an Argentinian took it up and he discovered that it was really pretty good for supraventricular tachycardia and for ventricular tachycardia. So the drug was isolated by a Belgian company in 1961, popularized in Europe. Medicine was used as a vasodilator for people who had chest pain, people who had angina, from 1962 to 1967 when they took it off the market because it had so many side effects. came back on the market in 1974, this time for use as an antiarrhythmic couldn't get into the United States. The FDA said no, but it was illegally imported in the late 1970s. And it really ticked off the European pharmaceutical companies, and they threatened to cut off the supply unless the FDA approved it. So in 1985, it was approved by the FDA, actually one of the few drugs that was approved without any clinical trials. It's now among the top 200 drugs prescribed in the United States with more than 2 million prescriptions a year, and it's on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. GoodRx says you can go buy the medicine, 200 milligram pills, 30 of them. Cash price would be 30 to 60 dollars with a coupon from them. 9 to 15 dollars unless you go to CVS it would cost 25 dollars with a coupon. And the brand name Carderone is no longer available. So that's the story of amiodarone. It's powerful, it's helpful, but unfortunately it's potentially toxic. It's one of those drugs where you really need a doctor who's well versed in arrhythmias in order to prescribe the drug. And you need periodic reevaluations at least every six months because there are so many side effects associated with this drug. But at least right now, if you have arrhythmias, this might be as good as it gets. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend and consider subscribing to our channel so that you'll be informed of new videos when we post them. I appreciate your time. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.